Hello everyone and welcome to day 11 of Advent of Code 2019 in Rust. Um, for those who have not been following along, this video is day 11 of a larger series on Advent of Code, solving Advent of Code problems in Rust and you can find them here on my YouTube channel which is where you're probably watching this. And as I mentioned every video, the code for this, uh, the code that we're writing is up on this repository under BC Myers AOC 2019. And uh, we are at the same point we left off after day 10, except for I've done the setup for days 11, 12, 13, and 14. Um, because, although I haven't been making videos of the past, in the past few days, apologies for that. Oh, let's go back to here. Um, I have solved uh, 11, 12, 13, and 14. I have yet to look at 15 and 16 yet. I just haven't had the time. Um, but hopefully I'm going to be able to create, uh, in fairly short order, a series of videos. Maybe uh, today or tomorrow you'll get all these videos for 11, 12, 13, and 14 coming out. Um, but for the moment, we're just doing day 11. Um, so before I jump into that, I somebody posted a comment on one of the videos that asked if I could talk briefly about my editor setup. So I would love to do that. Um, so first of all, um, this is just going to be a brief overview and maybe we'll do another video that just sort of deep dives into my editor setup and all that kind of stuff if you guys want. But for the moment, let me just go over it briefly in sort of five minutes or 10 minutes. Um, so the first thing I wanted to mention is the terminal uh, I use, the shell or I guess terminal application I use is called Alacrity which is a nice little terminal and written in Rust. Um, it's extremely fast and sort of uses the GPU, which I have in this computer. I have a NVIDIA GPU that I should be using. So, um, And it works on Mac OS, Linux, BSD, and Windows. So um, it's just a simple terminal program, and I like it. And I also like it because it's written in Rust. So Alacrity has been great. The second thing I use in my videos is something called Tmux which when you run it, uh, just sort of opens up, um, I mean, it looks like a regular terminal, um, but what Tmux gives you is the ability to create these split panes and do things in them. Um, so when you see me sort of using the shell on the right hand side of the screen, it's because I'm using Tmux to um, open up multiple windows at a time. I tend to use it like this, just for vertical splits and horizontal splits, but you can also, let's see if I do, Command AC, I can create a whole new set, uh, whole new window down here. So I've created the one window. And let's go into Python so that you can see in this window I'm in Python, but everything I was still doing before in Bash is still available to me if I hit uh, the, uh, well for me it's, I, I've, I'll show you the, I'll show you the setup for this in my tmux.com. For, for me it's uh, caps lock A in, goes to the next window. Um, and so I can cycle through the windows like this. Um, and for me, I've customized this, but it's uh, caps lock A um, dash to split this way, caps lock A, uh, what is that? Not f backslash uh, to split this way. And to get out, you just sort of exit all over the place. Um, but Tmux is really neat, um, and I like it, and um, it allows me to sort of have a shell open on the right, you know, and move this over here while uh, on the left I'm working in my editor. Which brings me to, oh, that's Tmux. So here's the GitHub page for Tmux. Which brings me to my editor, which is NeoVim, which is uh, basically a fork of Vim. And... Uh, is takes a little bit getting used to, but NeoVim is, let's see. Oh, I don't want to be in here. I want to be in lib AOC. So NeoVim is, I just opened up NeoVim and I have it set up to open up this sort of nerd tree tab when I open it. And we go into a file and if I hit um, sort of caps lock in for me, which again is a customized key command, I get this, this is called a nerd tree, <laughs> um, which sort of is a plugin to Vim that brings up like your files. And so as you've seen me working in these videos, right, this all is NeoVim. And this is the nerd tree plugin in NeoVim. And the entire window, I guess, is Tmux with 
sort of the multiple panes, and all of that is running in Alacrity. Um, so let me give you the very basics of my setup for uh, Tmux and NeoVim, and I'll post these. I have the, I have my dot files all on GitHub somewhere, but the repository is in a huge messy state right now because I messed around with it and never really finished it. But I'll try and get those. I'll try and get my these dot files I'm about to show you in good shape and put them up on GitHub so you can see my exact setup. But um, to configure Tmux in your home directory, right? You just create this file called tmux.conf. And mine does a couple of customizations. So by default, the, uh, the sort of control binding for Tmux, the thing that you push before you do all the commands, is uh, control B, but um, I've set mine to control A. Um, and control for me also, this is a Linux thing, but I've remapped caps lock to control. So when I say control anything, what I'm really hitting is caps lock that thing. Um, so command A sort of starts a tmux command and then you finish it with whatever you want to do, like that. Um, I rebound the splitting the window um, this way to, as I mentioned, the, um, oops, go back. Yeah, let me close these windows. Um, to the uh, backslash character which needs to be escaped. So this is not me hitting backslash twice. This is I'm binding just the backslash character to split window um, dash, dash, dash H. I've customized the split window this way to, um, to uh, the dash character, create new window. That's when I create a new window and then I can cycle back and forth with go to the next window go to the previous window, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then I've set some various other options which you can sort of peruse uh, at your leisure. Oh, uh, the status bar down here, right? The fact that it's red and it has my name and it's sort of all customized with the clock in the bottom right hand corner. That's all done in this these sort of settings for the status bar. Um, and the theme, right? So here I'm setting the status bar background color to red and the foreground color to white. Um, some stuff about copying and pasting, bindings to resize the window, so when I do this, um, that's all set here. Um, so that is generally some of the things you can do in Tmux to customize it the way you want. Um, so that's my Tmux conf, uh, brief overview. And then the, the, the other important file, um, if you want to get a setup sort of somewhat like this, is my vimrc. Uh, so first of all, in NeoVim, let me explain. Uh, in NeoVim, uh, what you can do is NeoVim will read a configuration file in your home directory dot config slash NeoVim, and what's it called? Uh, init.vim. So this file is really, really small. And all you do is put these four lines in and then it will be completely compatible with a regular Vim setup. Um, so it will use um, it'll use this directory, which is what normal Vim usually uses to find all of the plugins, and it will use this file, which is what normal Vim usually uses to set all the settings. So you need to put those four lines in your init.vim in this NeoVim folder in your config folder, um, and so then it will pull everything from your vimrc which you put in your home folder. And my vimrc is very long, but I'll try and give you the basics of it, right? So I have some plugins that I'm using. Um, and to pull these plugins in, I use this overall sort of plugin manager called vimplug. And you can see uh, just on the GitHub page how to install it. It's very easy. Um, and then uh, I pull in these plugins, and the way to read these plugins are they are sort of the GitHub username and the GitHub repository of the various people who've written these plugins. Um, so Git Gutter, I think, is what shows you on the left here. Uh, this says if I made any updates since the last Git commit to this file. Um, so here I've sort of fooled around with it since the last time I committed it to GitHub. So you can see this is showing up as an addition and changes and moving around. That's Git gutter. This is probably what you guys are most curious about, the language client NeoVim. This is what gives me in Rust 
um, the errors. So let's go to let's open up our project. And if I go to I don't know day ten, and I come up here and I I make an error. So the language client NeoVim, I think. I'm pretty sure is the thing that is giving me this red error right here. Um, and so if you're curious how I'm getting sort of inline errors and warnings, that's through this thingy. Um, Lightline is just this visual thing down here. Vim better white space is if I ever save a file, try and save a file and there's white space at the end of the line, it will highlight it in red. And then when I try and write, it'll tell me, and then I'll ask if I want to delete it, and I say yes. Uh, delimit mate just says like if I type, if I type uh, parentheses or uh, quotes or brackets, right? It's going to fill in the end uh, of it for me. Nerd tree, like I said, is this very 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 useful plugin where you sort of uh, I have the command to pull it up, map to caps lock in. But if I just toggle caps lock in, then I'm pulling up a list of the files in the folder I'm in. Um, so Nerdtree is a wonderful plugin. Vim Polyglot and Dioplete and Syntastic are all sort of, I think, have to do with like syntax highlighting for various languages. This, I think, is my color scheme. And Vim Commentary, this is a very useful plugin. If I hit GCC, it will comment and uncomment a line. Or if I select multiple lines and hit GCC, it will comment those out. Um, so that's Vim Commentary. Um, and then I have a couple language specific plugins that I use one for C, CSS, Go, JavaScript, Python. And then in Rust, there's a plugin specific for Toml, which is what the um, the language of your cargo.toml. There's one for RON, which is a serialization format. <laughs> kind of like JSON, except for it works better with Rust. You don't really need to know about this unless you have a use for RON. And then this is, uh, this is the sort of magic that gives you Rust font on your file. So if you notice, if I come into a Rust file, and, uh, you know, well, if I just save, right, Rust Fump is gonna, Rust Fump is gonna run automatically and format the files. And this comes from the Rustlang, Rustlang's own Vim, Vim plugin. Oh, I got the hiccups, so sorry guys. Then I have a whole bunch of customizations just related to Vim, which again, once I get this sort of up on GitHub in a good spot, you, you can uh, you can see what all these are yourselves. Some more customizations, uh, more customizations, but Rust specific stuff that I think you need to know is down here. I sort of configure things uh, for Rust specifically, or I guess right here. So I just make sure whenever I'm in a Rust file that I get a color column um, at um, 100 characters, which is the default of what Rust Pump uses to wrap your your text. And then I set all of the tabs and stuff to spaces and, and using four characters. And then here is all my configurations for Rust Pump autosave. So this turns on autosave. This says use Rust bumped. Um, I set the addition to 2018, uh, which unfortunately is not the default yet for. Um, uh, so if you're working with any 2018 features, specifically async await, use that. I'm not sure what this does. I'm not sure what that does. I'm not sure what that does. Um, so that's sort of my Rust specific configuration. Oh, and uh, I guess down here in language client. This is where I tell the language client uh, which version of RLS to use. Um, Nerdtree, which is extremely helpful and one of my favorite plugins, has a bunch of customizations here. 
Uh, and I, I, that, that's basically it. That's like a high-level overview of my Vim setup, um, my NeoVim setup, and Tmux and my terminal and how I'm doing all of this for you. So with that, I think I might take a break because I've got the hiccups. And uh, so I'll be back in just a second after I get a cup of water. Okay. Uh, I'm back. Sorry about that, guys. I still have the hiccups, but let's see if we can move forward from here. Um, so with that, I want to uh, I want to start in on day 11. So let me go to Advent of Code and explain to you guys the day 11 problem. Um, well, it, since I don't like reading the text, I'll just sort of explain to you the problem um, if you haven't read it already. So today we have... Well, a robot that's going to paint the outside of our ship. And it's going to take in an int code program that tells it um, what it needs to be doing. Um, but basically our ship, the outside of our ship has a bunch of tiles on it. And the tiles are either black or white. Um, uh, they're going to be painted either black or white. They, they all start as black. And our robot is going to start on sort of a just canonical tile that we'll call point zero zero. And it's going to want to receive uh, an input, um, which is either gonna be a zero if it's sitting on a black tile or a one if it's sitting on a white tile. And then it's gonna output two things, uh, the robot or the computer inside the robot. It's gonna output uh, first, whether or not it wants to paint the current tile it's on black or white. So it'll give us a zero if it wants to paint it black and a one if it wants to paint it white. And then the second thing it's gonna output is it's gonna give us a zero if uh, it wants to turn left and a one if it wants to turn right by 90 degrees. So after every time it turns, or it gives you this sort of output, tells you which way it wants to turn, you need to turn it and move it forward one tile and it will sort of continue to paint the outside of your ship this way um, until the program halts. Um, and so there are two basic questions. The first question is, um, if you tell it that the initial tile is black, um, then what is the total number of tiles that it paints before it halts? Um, and the second question is, if you start it with um, the white color as the first input, uh, just basically what does, it, what does it paint for you? Um, so you need to, we, we have to do ASCII art to figure out what it actually paints. Um, and that is day 11 in a nutshell. Um, so hopefully that was explained well. Our input, um, since you know this is a program, is another encode program. So we're going to use our computer. So let's get to sort of coding this up. Um, and I think, I think I want to make some changes. Yes. So we have this point type in our utilities folder, which we are going to just change to be a little bit more robust. And this is anticip in anticipation of later days, um, but we're gonna start working with three-dimensional sort of points in space as well. So I wanna make this a little bit more generic and say, uh, this has nothing to do with day 11, but let's just get this sort of utility change out of the way. I want this to be a VEC2, and what the heck, let's make it generic. Um, so, um, we'll now be calling this a VEC2 and it'll be generic over a T. Um, and this can be a constant function, which we're gonna need. Um, it's gonna take a T and another T and output self. And then if, so that's gonna be the constructor for any vec2, but if we have a vec2 where t is copy, then we can do the things below, because the thing, the these sort of getter methods on x and y, the way we've written them, they require the type to be copy. Um, so instead of returning i64, we run a return to t. And I think that is, I think that is the sort of general changes I wanted to be I make to VEC2, which is going to break a lot of things. So let's go in here and see, compile, and see um, where we broke things. Uh, 
the reason why I'm making this change is because soon we're going to have, um, while this is compiling, I'll explain to you, we're going to have a VEC3, right? Et cetera, et cetera. Oh, and of course, in day nine, I the error I left in to show you is there. So cargo check. All right, so we have a problem in utilities. We have an unclosed delimiter because this needs to be closed. All right, where are the other errors? So in day 10, there's no point type anymore because we renamed it to vec2. But what we can do is just say type point is equal to a vec2 of i64 is up here, and now all the code should continue to work. Good. Is that all we needed to do? Cargo test. Oh, sorry guys, I should have done these compilings all ahead of time. Uh, so that they would work faster. Well, I think this is going to work. So let's just go into day 11 and start working on what we need to do. So we're going to need a computer. Use computer, computer, and ROM. Oh, and let's see what the, ch the state of our computer is in. Oh, not use computer. Use create computer. Let's see what the state of our computer is in, because I think I made some changes to this over the past four days that I did. So we still have a ROM, we still get it from a reader. Channel. Um, still create a new computer. Oh, this is, some, this is a change I wanted to make for a long time. So we want to say, let's have a default computer. Which just gives us this where input and output are uh, channel defaults, right? But let's have the constructor be, um, so if you want to create a computer which is default channels, you use the default constructor. This is going to be not new, but with I.O. So you're going to be able to pass it specific input and output if you want. Um, all right. I think I had more changes to the computer, but I wanted to do that quickly. So let's cargo check and see what we broke. We broke a lot of things. So we broke stuff in day five, because now this is just a computer default. And we don't need channel anymore. What else did we break? Um, we broke stuff in day two. This is just the computer default. And we probably don't need channel anymore. All right, where else do we break stuff? We broke stuff in day seven. Uh, here we do want to give it specific IO, so we want to use the with IO constructor. All right, um, and in day nine we broke stuff. So day nine. Gosh, we've used the computer quite a bit. So default. 
that means we will no longer use need channel. And we probably broke stuff. Well, this is going to compile now, but we probably broke stuff in the tests. So cargo check tests. Yep, definitely broke stuff in the tests. So this is computer default. Computer, we broke stuff in computer's tests because this is computer default. Okay, that's it. Wonderful. Um, okay. So let's go back to day 11. So um, we got our computer in shape, we got our, our point and everything. So I want to create an idea of, well, I guess we need to, we're going to get a ROM. So ROM from reader, right? Reader, which can fail. All right. I want to create the idea of a robot. So struct robot. And this robot is going to keep track of the points it's painting, right? Which I'll call a grid, um, which is going to be a hash map of points to colors. Um, so we want to know for every point that it paints, what color did it paint it? which means we're going to need utils vec2 and we're going to have type point equals vec2 of i64s so we now have a color type color is going to be an enum which is either black uh, which corresponds to zero or white which corresponds to one so this enum needs to derive all the things, copy, clone, uh, debug, default, sure, um, eek, and partial eek, and hash. And I want this enum to be represented in memory as a U8. Um, Oh, we can't drive default. Um, so that is our color type for the moment. And we need, we're using hash maps, so standard collections hash map. Good. So we got a robot. It is going to paint a grid. Um, and we've got a color type. Our robot is also going to need to know where it's located. So it needs a location, which is a location. And the location of our robot is a struct that contains the point where it's at and the direction it's facing. We're going to need to keep track of that. So the direction is an enum which is either going to be north, south, east, east, or west. Good. And there's no reason why this can't just derive all the things. OK. So our robot is going to have to know it's going to paint a grid and it's going to have to know where it is at all times. So when we implement a robot, what we're going to do is we're not going to even have a constructor. Well, I guess this is a sort of a constructor. We're going to have a run function that takes in a ROM and takes in the initial color. Because remember, in part one, we have to tell it the initial color is black. In part two, we have to tell it the initial color is white. Let me take a drink here. I'm going to take in a color. And it is going to output a robot or an error. Oops. Uh, 
unimplemented. All right. So we got a robot. And what we want to do for part one, we're going to get out a robot when we call robot run, pass it a reference to the ROM, and color black. So we got a robot. Good. All right. Oh, and the answer to the first question, right? is going to be how many points did we paint, right? So let answer one is robot dot grid dot um, well keys dot count, right? Just how many points did we end up painting? And that is going to be answer and sir one. Um, for answer two, we're going to create a different robot. Pass the ROM and start it out with white. And then we're going to want to print, well, create a string of ASCII art. So answer two is going to be, we'll just ask the robot to print out the grid, right? Um, we'll implement the display trait on robots so that it can print out the grid if you try and display it. And so if you implement display on something, it automatically gets a two string method. And that'll be answer two. Which it's already going to be a string, so answer two. But for that to exist on robot, it needs to know how to display itself. So impl font display for robot, which the display trait requires one um, function to be implemented, font, which takes in self and immutable reference to a font formatter, and it returns a font result. And for the moment, it's just going to write into the formatter foo. Um, and this will be a to-do. And we need to pull in the font module from the standard library. All right. So that's some more basic building blocks out of the way. But at least now we have our um, the skeleton of solving the problem already lined up. All right, so today today is going to be relative. I mean, it's going to be really simple, right? So all we need to do is we're going to be at a location and we're going to get some uh, some data back from the computer, and so we need to know how to what location we go to next. So I know I'm jumping around here, but let's just accomplish the things in the random order that I'm thinking of them. So we want to the we want to know if you're at a certain location and you're given well I guess a turn which way you're gonna turn then you need to tell me where you go to next so the location is gonna tell us that which means we're gonna need a turn type so turn is gonna be an enum of just left and right so you can either turn left or you can turn right and for reasons that I'll make clear later, let's make this a repr u8. And turn left is going to be, let's go back to the problem. So if you get the direction to turn, zero means turn left and one means turn right. So this is zero and this is one. All right, and let's get these in alphabetical order so I can find myself in the file. Um, direction goes before location, but after color. All right, 
Um, okay, so we got a turn type now, and the location needs to know if you uh, are at a specific location and you take a specific turn, what is your next location? Well, this should be fairly easy. We um, need to match on uh, turn. If we turn left, we do something. If we turn right, we do something. And I, if you guys don't, I could write out turn colon colon here, but if you guys want to know a little trick, like inside a function, just inside this little namespace of only this function, I can say use self turn star. And now I have access directly to left and right, and I don't have to write out, I don't have to write out the fully qualified name of this enum variant. I can just write left and right. Um, okay, so if we're at a particular point, well really what we want to know is we want to know what the next direction is, right? Not whether or not we're turning or not. So let's actually make, let's make a function on direction that tells us if we're given a turn, which direction do we go in next? This will make things easier. So if you give me a direction, uh, if I'm, I'm facing a particular way and you give me a turn, I'm going to tell you the next direction I'm in. So let's just build this out. Let's match on both self and the turn. And if I, and let's use self direction star and use self turn star. If I am north, facing north, but then I turn uh, left, right? Well, then I'm facing west. If I'm north and I turn right, well, then I'm facing east. And we're going to need to replicate this one, two, three more times. So if I'm south and I turn left, I'm south and I turn uh, right. If I'm east and I turn right, left, or if I'm east and I turn right, or if I am west and I turn right and west, oops, west. So I think I got all of the cases here, but we need to get the right-hand side. So north, left, north, right, south, left, south, right, east, left, east, right, west, left. Yes. Okay, good. So if you're north and you turn left, then you're facing west. If you're north and you turn right, you're facing east. If you're south and you turn left, you're facing east. If you're south and you turn right, you're facing west. Um... If you are east and you turn left, you're facing north. If you're east and you turn right, you're facing south. If you're west and you turn left, you go south. And if you're west and you turn right, then you go north. And that is that function all done, I believe. So now we know if we're facing a certain direction and we get a turn instruction, what's the new direction we're going to be facing? So this becomes easier, right? We know that our uh, next direction is self.direction.next turn, right? Um, and now all we need to do is say, well, where are we, right? Uh, which point are we at? Let's get our next point. If, no, um, let's get our next point, but that's going to depend on our, the next direction we go in, right? So um, if we're going uh, north, let's see, north, south, uh, east, west, Use self turn 
star. So if we're going, uh, if our next direction is north, then our next point, right, is going to be wherever we were before. So let's pull that out. Um, x comma y equals um, self dot point dot x comma self dot point dot y. So this is where we were, right? And where we're going to be is, uh, if we're going north, we're going to be at the same x, but y plus 1, right? If we're going south, we're going to be at the same x, but y minus 1. If we're going east, we're going to be x plus 1, y. And if we're going west, we're going to be at x minus 1, y. All right. Um, Oh, not self that turn. We're going to use self that direction. Sorry. All right. So now we know where we end up, which is just self. Uh, direction is next direction, and point is next point, and that's this function done. Oh, these need to be points. So. Point, 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 point. And you can't create a point like that. New. Uh, well, actually, we should have. Do we have this yet? Oh no. Uh, let's try this. Into. You should be able to give a tuple, and it should be able to make a point. But we have not implemented that, so let's add that to our utility type here. So if you if you have, so we should implement from a tuple of t's for vec uh, two t. So if you have a tuple of t's, you should be able to create a vec two of t's. So function from uh, tuple the tuple of t's, and we should be able to get up a vector. Uh, two vector, and so that's just self um, two zero two one. There we go. So now that we have that implemented, this should just work, and it does. Um, so we're constructing tuples, right? So what returns from this mass match expression is now a tuple. And then we call into on it, and it will know it needs to turn itself into a point because this right here takes a point. Um, so that's all sort of done and dusted. So now we know um, if we're at a particular location and we get an instruction to turn, what is the next location that we go to? Um, so I think we're ready. I think we're ready to uh, start implementing this run function on the robot. So, uh, like all of our computers before, because we have these um, sort of cross-beam channels, right, we're going to run our computers in a separate thread. So let's say uh, we're going to use cross-beam thread and we are going to say thread scope which will give us an s and well in the closure that this takes a closure in that closure you get s as a parameter and we're going to have a handle which is s dot spawn and we are going to spawn a worker thread. And on that worker thread, we're going to create a computer. Uh, let computer equals computer. It's going to need to know its input and output channels. And then we are going to computer.execute the ROM with no noun verb, which can fail. 
and then we are going to return OK. Um, and this is probably going to need to know that it is that type of result. So that's our handle. And then we are going to do some things to do. And eventually, we want to join that handle and return OK of, well, we got to return a robot here, right? Dot unwrap, and there we go. All right, so can't find input and output. That's because we want to create input and output ourselves. So input and output are going to be new channels. So channel default and channel default, which means we're going to need channel. Um, but the reason why we create them out here is because we're going to want to, I guess this can be in the scope of the thread, it doesn't really matter. Um, we are going to want to um, move them into this worker thread, right? But we're also going to want to first get a handle to, we want to be able to send data into the input and pull it out from the output. Um, and so this is something we haven't added to channel, but basically what I want to be able to say, we're going to modify channel here in a second. I want to be able to say, a channel, remember, is composed of a sender and a receiver. So I, I only want on the main thread to be able to send stuff on input. I don't care about receiving stuff on input. So I want to be able to say something like input into parts here that will um, return us the sender and the receiver. And I'm just going to drop the receiver because we're not going to use it on the main thread. Um, and similarly, I want to get a handle. I don't care about the sender for the output channel, but I want a receiver uh, for the output channel. And so this is going to be output into parts. But really, oh, so we're going to have to clone these because we want um, Remember, cloning a channel is costless, right? We're just bumping the arc, but we don't. We want to be able to reuse it, so we we clone these, and then we're going to we're, we clone the input channel, and then we're going to turn that input. We're going to break that input channel down into its sender and its receiver. We're going to drop the receiver, and so now we'll have a sender on the main thread that we can use um, to send data into the computer. And similarly. Um, we're going to, on the output channel, first clone it and then break it down into a sender receiver, drop the sender, and we're going to have a receiver for the output channel on the main thread. Um, so that means down here we can do stuff with the sender and the receiver. So the first thing we want to do with the sender is we want to send the right color, right? Um, which should not fail because if it fails, something went wrong here. Um, so this is sort of tell computer what color to start with, right? But we can't send, these are channels of I64, so this needs to be color as I64. That's, we'll send it. And then we'll wait back, we'll wait for the output. We need to receive output on the output channel. And this is going to be, the first thing it sends back is, a color, the, what color to paint uh, the panel. So this is going to be a color. Um, well, it's really going to be an I64, but we need to implement color try from the I64 that we get back. Um, and then it's next going to send the turn. So we should get a turn, which is turn try from whatever we receive from the channel. And then we're going to do some stuff. And I'm probably moving a little too fast, so I'm just going to leave it there for a second. All right, so we got some problems. Um, the problems are that, uh, well, first of all, we don't, we don't have a robot, so let's create a robot. <laughs> so it's going to be mutable. Robot is going to be a self with the grid. It's just going to be hash map default. It's going to start out with nothing in it. The location is going to be uh, location where the point is. We're going to start out at 0, 0, right? Uh, 
and the direction we're going to start out pointing north. So that's our robot and then we will say that the very first um, the very first point, right, um, is the color that we were passed. So now we have a, we, we sort of created a robot, right? And then we started up the computer, and then we're going to read stuff off of the computer in a loop. Oops which we'll need to break somehow, so we'll figure that out. And then eventually, uh, once this breaks, the worker thread should be done, so we join and we return the robot. Um, and this is robot.grid.insert. All right, so let's let's handle this into parts function, right? I, uh, hopefully this was clear. All I want to be able to do on a channel, where's our channel? is I want to be able to say pub create function into parts and if you give me a channel I will give you a sender of t's and a receiver of t's and all I need to do to do that is to say self.sender self.receiver Um, right. So now we can get raw access to the senders and receivers. And so back here in day 11, this should be fine now. Um, so now we need to um, be able to take an integer that we get back from the computer and turn it into a color. And we need to do the same thing for a turn. We need to be able to turn an integer into a turn. So for color here, we'll just say impl try from i64 for color. We'll say fu function try from uh, i i64 gives me a result of self or self dot self error, which means we need to if we fail to parse a number into a color then we're going to return an error and all we need to do is match on i and if i is zero then well we return okay well let's do it this way we return color black and if i is one we return color white and if i is anything else then we have uh, cannot parse this number into a color right um, so this match arm is going to return a color, and we want to say OK color to return it. And we're going to need try from. Use standard convert try from. All right, so let's go back down here and see that I did that right. And I need that did that right. We can now parse a number into a color, and we need to be able to parse a turn a uh, number into a turn. So let's go down here to turn and essentially have the same code, except for we are gonna, it's not gonna be a color, it's gonna be a turn. And we want to say turn left is zero, and turn right is one. Cannot parse blank into a turn. All right. So now, if we go back up here to this sort of code we were slowly piecing together in a haphazard way, um, um, let's get let's just put this there to get us stop warning about not using things. That needs to be that. Um, Okay, so when we run, when we have, a, when we call run on robot, we don't need a robot to call run. We just call run. It's a static method, right? We pass it the program and the initial color, 
It's going to output us a robot. So the first thing we do is we create a robot, right? Um, that starts out with sort of, well, it starts out with only one thing in its grid, which is the point zero zero and the initial color that we say that point was, right? Um, and it starts out with a location, which is it's sitting at zero zero, it's facing north. So we got our robot, right? Now, uh, what we do is we create a computer on a different thread, right? So we spawn off a thread, create a computer, um, and start executing the program, the ROM. This computer needs to know input and output channels, so we create them here. Right? But before we pass these input and output channels into the worker thread here, we just get a handle right using this to a sender, which, to, which we can use to send uh, input to the computer, and a receiver, which we can use to get output from the receiver. Um, so now we've got our computer all set up. And now we run a loop. We sort of just run the program, right? which is going to require sending instructions and receiving, receiving instructions and all this kind of stuff. And so let's sort of abstract what you do in here into like a separate method on robot. So let's just say the, when the robot steps forward in time by one, right, it's going to do some things. Um, and it's going to need to know, it's going to need a, um, to be able to send stuff to the robot to the computer and it's going to be able to receive stuff from the computer and if it knows those things it can do like one step right it can process like one instruction and so this can probably maybe fail and it needs to return an option of nothing or an error because it needs to know when it's done right so when it's done we'll return uh, none um, or we'll return OK of none, and when it's uh, when it's not done, we'll return OK of some, and so we know that we can keep calling step, which means this stuff in here, right? Well, all of this code is going to be part of step now. Oops. Uh, so we'll get to that in a second. Uh, but now this loop can just be robot dot step and pass it, I guess these need to be references, a reference to the sender and a reference to the receiver. And this can return a result. But if it's a result, if the OK case is none, then we need to break from the loop. So I guess this can be while, while all of this business is sum. No. This still needs to be a loop. All right. So this needs to get a reference because we're going to be doing this in a loop. And this needs to get a reference. And I don't know what this K is doing down here. And now all we need is the sender and receiver types. So use crossbeam channel sender receiver all right so why are you not working or go check oh we need an if here if we get a none back from the step function, then we need to break. Otherwise, we're just going to keep doing it over and over again. Um, OK, so now we need to do. Now all we need to do is figure out uh, what we do on sort of every step of the computer. Um, and that's easy, right? First, we send an instruction to the computer. Um, and we send it, oh. Uh, this needs to know the initial color. Oh, so the color we know, we already stored the color of the initial tile, right? Um, so the color of the initial tile is um, 
what we want to know, we want to look at the grid and get out the point where we are, which is self location dot point. And this should never fail um, for reasons I will explain later, which will return as a reference to a color. So dereference it. And then we the color needs to we send the color as an I64. Alright, so we send a color on every step. Right? And then we wait until we get back. Um, so for, uh, I should explain this better. So how the pr program is set up is you, you pass into the computer the color, the current color of the current location that you're standing on, right? But then after you send it in, the robot is going to paint that location a different color. And it's going to tell you um, in the output what color it painted it. So this is now the new color, right, of the location. Um, so I guess we can call this new color. And, and we want to record that we uh, painted this particular tile the new color, right? So we want to say self.grid.entry self.location.point dot well, I guess we know it's going to be in here, so we don't have to use entry. We can just say insert at this point the new color that it is. Right, and so we've recorded that the robot painted the particular location we're at, the particular point we're at. We painted it this new color, and then the robot is going to tell us where to turn to go next. Um, so it's going to give us the turn, and then we take that turn and we update our location. So self dot location is now going to be self dot location dot next with this turn and then we are done and so we return some because we don't know if the program's halted yet right so I think that's all there is to this function except for we have a problem right is we don't know when the program is halted um, but the way we figure that out, right, is every time we try and send something, so if the program halts, right, this computer, this line is going to return in our worker thread. The computer is going to exit and the whole thread is going to be done with, right? And so that means that the, uh, the receiver, so, okay, <laughs> I know I'm explaining this poorly. So um, this sender that we're using to send things from the main thread down here, we're using the sender to send on the input channel. But we dropped the handle that we had to that channel's receiver. So the only receiver for this input channel that stays alive is the one that's embedded in here, which gets passed to this. But after this exits, right, the worker thread is also going to drop its receiver. And so as soon as the program halts, right, the receiver on the input channel is going to be dropped. The only receiver on the input channel is going to be dropped. So if we call send on the sender, it's going to return an error. And that's how we know, right, that it's time to break here. So we actually want to match on this. And we want to say, if we get back a color, um, if we get back, if we get back the okay case, if, if everything was sent was okay, then we do nothing. But if we got an error, right, then that tells us we need to break with OK, none, which signals that this is the end and we need to stop doing stuff. But actually, you can write this in a better way. You can say if sender.send is error, then just return OK, none. So if we try and send something to the computer, but it's dropped its receiver, that means it's done, and we should be done too, right? And similarly for the uh, receiver.receive, so this is, if we try and receive something on the output channel, but 
the worker thread has dropped its receiver or dropped its sender, then we're going to get an error here, right? And so that should tell us that we need to break. So if we get an error here, well, if we get something back, let's turn it into a color. If we get an error back, right, well, it means we need to stop. Correct? And same with turn here. Um, match receiver dot receive. If we get a number back, we need to parse it as a turn. Try from I question mark. If we get an error back of any kind, right, well then we know that the computer has halted and exited, so we need to return none. So I think that's I think that's everything. The only thing left to do is once this run method exits, right? It will have been well, it's created a robot up here and it returns it. But all this business is going to mutate the internal state of the robot. The internal state of the robot contains a grid, um, and so we need to know how to print that grid, right? Um, which we have not implemented yet. That's the to do down here, but I think that's everything that's left. But let's, uh, this should be good enough for uh, part one. So let's do cargo run day 11 with data 11 and see if we get the right answer for part one. Uh oh. Which none value did we unwrap that was wrong? Rust back trace equals one, cargo run 11, data 11. So this Rust back, if you do Rust backtrace equals one and you run something in Rust, you get a backtrace. So it is in the step function. It looks like on, oops, where was that? On line 75 that we have a problem. So 75, Oh, interesting. So our grid does not contain where we are currently at, which it should always, right? Because we insert the initial point, which I guess we could hard code this to be self.location, or no, robot.location.point. We insert that into our grid. So zero, zero is there. It's definitely there before we call step. But then for whatever reason, oh, this needs to be, okay. If we, for the first one, the first one is gonna be there, right? But the second time we go around, we call step, right? We're gonna be at a new location that we've never seen before. And so clearly this is not gonna be in our grid. But the problem tells us, right, that the color of new um, of things we haven't seen it starts out as black always, right? So if we can't find it in our grid, it means that it was black. This needs to be a reference. All right, so now let's run it and see what it gives us. It gives us 2293, which I believe is the right answer. 2293. Good. So now the only thing that we need to do is the robot needs to know how to print its grid, right? So if we ask it to print itself with display or to string, how do we turn this hash map of points and colors that we have uh, been collecting up until now into a string? Well, so this is fun. Let's do it this way. Let's create a vector. Vec new. Um, actually, no, let's not create a vector because we know exactly how big this needs to be. So let's create a array of U8s that has some length. And what is the length going to be? Okay, 
So we need to create a buffer that has the following length. We need to know the max, the minimum y and the minimum x, or the, the maximum y and the minimum x and the minimum, the maximum x. Uh, that we came across. So like what's the range of possible values the, of points that we have seen in our grid, right? And so this should be relatively easy. It's self.grid dot keys. So over the points, right? Let's, for each point, we want point dot y and we want to find the minimum that we ever get. And we know that we initialize this grid with the origin point, and so there should always be something in here so we can unwrap here. Um, and so let's just repeat that four times. And the maximum y is just that same thing, but max and the minimum x is this, but x and the maximum x is that, but x. So now we have like, now we know sort of, like maybe our grid has been painted from like, you know, on the x-axis, let's say, from like negative 5 to like 42, right? Um, so we know that the sort of number of columns that we need, right, is going to be um, the maximum x minus the maximum y. So if you go and really plus one, right, I think. Because let's say it goes from like, let's make it easy. Let's say it goes from zero to five. So max x minus max y would give us five. But we need six columns, right? Because we, we have a zero, a one, a two, a three, a four, and a five. So that's six things. So the number of columns is max x minus max y, or max x minus min x. That's going to make my explanation really confusing. Plus one. And the number of rows in our little output is going to be max y minus min y plus one. OK, so hopefully I explained that well. Let's say like on the x-axis, we go from like, let's say, n negative one to one. Let's make it, let's, the minimum point has an x value of negative one. And the maximum point has an x value of one. Well, there's sort of three items in that list, right? So if we take uh, one and we subtract negative one, we get two. And add one, you get three. And that is the number of columns we need. And similar for the y-axis, that'll be the number of rows, right? And uh, so now we can create a buffer that is of length, well, rows times columns. So this, this is going to, we're going to end up turning this into a string, rows times columns. Um, so that's like how big our string is going to be, except for we want space for new line characters. So really, it's going to be rows times the number of columns plus one, because we need an extra space in each column for a new line character. So you have an empty buffer. And actually, this buffer should start out with everything just being a space. So you have an empty buffer of bytes that's just filled with spaces, and it's the right size. So for this is not a constant, and so we can't use an array. So let's use a vector. And these all need to be u sizes. They should definitely be positive. They can't be negative, right? So we're free to turn these into u sizes. All right. So now we just say for point in self dot for point color in self dot grid. 
the index into our buffer is going to be, um, let's see, the, well, let's just try and do the first column, right? So point dot x will give us the right index into the buffer. No, we need to normalize this. So point dot x minus the min x. So we're, we're not dealing with rows yet. Let's just deal with doing like the first row, right? Um, so now we can say buff at that index equals um, whatever we want to represent the color as. So Well, black will just be space, right? So we'll say if let color equals color white, then the character, oh, then, then we'll do all this stuff. Otherwise, we'll do nothing because we already have spaces in there, and that's what we want for black. Um, so the buff.index is, let's say, let's say hashtag as you ate. This needs to be a U size. This needs to be a reference. And this is just if color equals. So that should do, I mean, that should write something into our buffer. Let's see what it writes. Um, so let's just say write, so s is string from utf8 um, vec unwrap, because we know there's not going to be anything but ASCII characters in here. Um, and then just write 2f the display version of the string. And this is not vec, this is buff. Let's see what that gives us. Good, it looks like something. So we're uh, we're writing we're writing well this would be I guess the last we're writing things into the buffer but we're overwriting it because we're not doing the right columns right so the um, call index is this and the row index is something else. The row index is going to be something like point dot y minus min y as u size. So that's the column index and the row index. And to get the index from those, we just need to say, OK. So let's say you're the point 1, 1, right? Well, normalized 1, 1. So you want to be. rows times row index plus call index, I think. But we need the new line characters, right? So for row in 
zero dot dot rows. Buff calls equals the new line character as U8. So we, we might have some, we might have some, oh, uh, no, buff row times rows plus calls. We might have some off by, we definitely have some off by one errors here. So let's, uh, let's sort of print it out and see what we got. <laughs> yeah, there's something definitely wrong about that. So, I hate all these sort of off by one deals, and so I might end up cheating and just go back and look at what I already wrote for this. Because um, I don't feel like debugging this on camera. <laughs> but you guys get what we're doing. We're just creating a buffer, and we need to figure out like where, how to translate the 2D grid into that. So, so let me cheat. Uh, this is the first time you guys have seen me cheat, but I'm going to cheat because I want to be done with this video and get on to day 12 because it's much more interesting. So here's here's the good code. Let's just pull it in and I will talk about it. So you get deleted. Let's go back to, let's try it now. I don't know why it's having to recompile. There we go. We get the answer, which is A H L C P R A L. So let me see if I can explain this. Uh, okay. So we do uh, we do pull out the sort of we get the range across all the x and y's the way we were talking about, and the rows. I was right about rows and columns. It is indeed max y minus min y plus one, and max x minus min x plus one. The length of the array is indeed rows times columns plus one. And the reason why this plus one is here is because we need room for new line characters. We initialize a new vector. And then we iterate over all the points, but we exclude points that are black. We only take white points, right? And then, oh, I didn't mess this up. So I actually, I think I had a plus one in here somewhere. I didn't need it. So the x coordinate, the x index, right, in in a sense, is the normalized x coordinate. The y index is the normalized y uh, y uh, coordinate. And then where we write into the buffer, this is where there's all kinds of off one off by one errors that are confusing. So where we write into the buffer is we say um, well, oh, that's why I didn't do this. Columns, the number, okay. So this tells you, oh, right. This tells you sort of where and why you're writing, and this is the x. So x is super easy. Um, but where you write and y is, well, it's the number of rows minus 1. Um, but then we want to invert it because the 
Otherwise, it would write sort of this first, and then this, and then this. But we want it the other way around. We want it to write the last row at the top, then the second. And so you sort of invert it. And then you throw the new line characters in. And then you get a string. And that's all badly explained. But you guys uh, can sit here and sort of, I mean, there's easier ways to write this. Like we could create a vector of vectors that would, so, so each row would be its own vector. but. That's more wasteful, so this is just like a, this is a way to write the code we need to write to get the right answer. All right, so that is um, that is number day eleven, all complete. And um, I know I went quickly, but that's because, as you can probably tell, I, I didn't find this problem that interesting. I just found it kind of tedious. Um, day twelve is going to be much more interesting um, because I'm going to. Well, day 12 is kind of tedious too, but what's interesting about it is um, I get to talk about SIMD because there's an opportunity to use SIMD instructions. So I want to show you how to do that on Rust, which is totally unnecessary for the problem. But again, it's just an excuse um, because this is a place where you could possibly use SIMD. So we're going to talk about that. Um, and then day 13 is really interesting too because we get to make a game um, and you could just sort of print out the game to your terminal, but I figured, what the hey, like, let's actually write that in, um, let's use WASM to like uh, write Rust code that gets compiled to WebAssembly, and we will show the game in the browser as opposed to in the terminal. So day 12 and day 13 are going to be way more interesting than this, and I just wanted to get this one out of the way. Um, but hopefully you guys, hopefully you guys got it, and that is day 11 all sort of done. Let's uh, add a test. We can't really test, um, I don't know a good way to test this, um, but what we can test is easily, is we can test the answer to day one. So let's do that this way. Um, use super star, and we will just say let rom equals rom from reader, uh, reader, and the rom that we need to get is from File FS open uh, data eleven dot txt and we need a reader um, io buff reader new file. This means we're going to need oops use standard FS. So now we just call, we say let robot equals robot from, no, robot run. We pass it the ROM and we pass it color black. Which can fail. Oops. Un unwrap. All of these are in tests. We need to unwrap, uh, unwrap, and the answer to number one was how many, how many points did we see? Which is robot dot grid dot iter dot well dot keys dot count, right? Let actual equals. And we need to assert eek that actual equals uh, 2293. Let's see if that works. Cargo test. I don't know why it's having to recompile every time. I think I have something messed up in my my target directory. Something. How are we doing on time? 
Oh, an hour and 30 minutes. I guess that's about par for the course here. Oh, this is FS file open. Cargo test. And we tested day 11 and it passed. Good. All right, so that's day 11 sort of all done. Let me, uh, let me just run through the file one more time and then we will commit and we will be done with by the way, I'm using this, uh, remember, I'm using th uh, scope threads in Crossbeam so that we can send a reference to the ROM into the worker thread as opposed to having to clone, uh, clone the ROM and send it over. We can just pass a reference to it because we know that this reference, right, the lifetime of this reference is going to live beyond this scope. Um, But I think, I think that's it. So that is my solution to day 11. And let's do git status. Oh, we updated our computer and a bunch of stuff. So let's do git diff. Yep, into parts, that's fine. Default for computer with IO, default. Default computer, the changes we made there, computer. Um, we don't have a point type anymore, we have a VEC2, which is generic. And then here is the entire solution to day 11. And our test, and we updated the point type, so I think we're good. So git add all, git commit m day 11, git push. All right, let's check to make sure it was up there. And day 11 is all done and dusted. I guess we can make sure that we can, the benchmarks work. Cargo bench day 11. Again, sorry for rushing through this one, guys, but I find it uninteresting. I think 12 is going to be interesting because we get to talk about SIMD a bit, and 13 is going to be interesting uh, because I'd like to I'd like to make a, a WebAssembly program for you, and um, I'll put this game that we're playing in the um, in the browser. It looks like the benchmarks work. It's just they're going to take a while, so that's fine. Um, let us. Uh, sign off here and hopefully I'll record just back to back I'll get 12 in and maybe even 13 tonight but I've got a backlog I've, again I've solved 12, 13, 14 I just haven't made videos for them and then 15 and 16 are already out so I'm behind I'm sorry about that but hopefully I will continue to make videos and continue explaining some basic Rust stuff and uh, if as always if you guys have any comments or suggestions or questions or you know, things you'd like me to talk about or, you know, just feedback of any kind in general, please, please let me know in the comment section. Um, and otherwise, I'll see you next time. Thanks.